Dr. Slobodnik develops personalized plans to help diagnose and treat patients' conditions. During her free time, she enjoys reading, especially mysteries, historical novels, visiting art museums, traveling, staying healthy and fit, and doing needlepoint. And pretty soon, she's going to be busy doing other things, but I'll let you, leave that to your imagination. <laughs> but without further ado, this talk is Living with Gout, and I was just going to, we were just talking about this. Some of the medications that we use in cardiology actually exacerbate um, gout. So this is a really fascinating talk, and um, I think you'll enjoy it. Without further ado. Thank you, Dr. Cusack. Okay. So, um, so I'm, oops, I'm going to be talking about gout today, as you could see. And some of the questions that I'm going to address are, what is gout? Uh, where does it come from? How is it diagnosed? Does having gout increase risk for having other health problems? Uh, and how is gout treated? And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to just raise your hand or shout them out whenever they come to your mind. Uh, so starting with what is gout? So gout is a type of arthritis. Um, and what is arthritis? I'll just go through that very briefly. So arthritis is pain, swelling, stiffness, and deformity of the joints. Um, it can affect any joint of the body. And I just gave an example of what uh, jo some of the joints are, just um, for anyone who's not sure. So a joint is basically a connection between uh, two bones, and that's the area where we really you know, move our limbs um, and our extremities. Um, examples include shoulders, elbows, hips, wrists, knees. Uh, each of our fingers has three separate joints. Uh, and just, oops, uh, just a little bit more information about what a joint is because it's relevant to gout and other types of arthritis. Um, this is just what a joint looks like on an anatomy level. So um, as you can see on the top and bottom, there's two different bones. And between them, usually, there's found a space that helps to cushion the area between them um, and to help it to move and bend more easily. Uh, so within that space between the two bones, usually there's fluid, uh, and then there's also a hard capsule that surrounds them that helps to protect the area. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the common symptoms of gout flare. So how do you know that you're having a flare? I'm, sounds like a lot of you already know <laughs> how you have one, but basically what happens is that you get sudden onset of pain, swelling, warmth, and redness in one or a few joints, typically. Uh, a lot of times it tends to happen actually in the middle of the night or early in the morning. Uh, it's most severe within 24 hours of you getting the symptoms, usually. Uh, and then uh, a lot of times people have difficulty walking and bearing weight. Uh, one of the classic things that we often hear is that, uh, you know, I woke up early in the morning and I, it was so painful in my foot that I had difficulty even putting a sheet over the foot because I was having so much pain. That's one of the classic things that people usually say that they have with gout. Uh, so true or false, gout flares usually resolve on their own after a few days, even without treatment. Uh, actually, um, it's true, yeah. <laughs> oh, do you have a question? No, no, I'll talk about that later. It can happen in any joint of the body, pretty much. And I'll give some examples of, of places where it can happen commonly. Um, so, yeah, it does depend. You're, you're right. But um, usually with early gout, so when you get the initial flares, uh, it tends to resolve on its own after about two to five days on average. Uh, if gout goes untreated for many years, uh, the flares tend to get more prolonged and more frequent, so it gets harder to, for them to resolve on their own, and they tend to need treatment more often. But usually, initially, with gout flares, uh, after a few days, classically, they get better on their own. So some of the common symptoms... Hmm? Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> there, there it is. So in terms of some other common symptoms of gap flares, um, as I mentioned, they usually resolve on their own after a few days. And they can recur either in the same joint or a different joint when you get a repeat flare. Um, usually if you have, if someone has um, 
already wear and tear kind of arthritis in any particular joint or if they've had any kind of injury to one of their joints in the past, it actually increases your risk of getting a gout flare in that part of the body in the future. So, you know, if someone, for example, had a fracture um, of their ankle before, they could get gout flares repeatedly in that ankle because that's kind of where the increased risk is of getting the flare. Uh, and this is an example of a typical place where you can get a gout flare. Um, it's on the top of the foot. So you get a lot of swelling, a lot of redness here in the right foot specifically compared to the left. Uh, some other common places for gout flares are in the great toe. This is kind of one of the classic places. Uh, and then also the ankle is a pretty common place to get it as well. But you can really get flares anywhere. Um, you get them in the hands, as you can see in the picture on the upper left. Uh, you get in the clavicle. Um, sometimes There's some research coming out uh, that you could get gout deposits in the back. So there's studies looking into whether some people with chronic low back pain um, can actually have gout as one of the contributing factors to their symptoms. Why would it be in the Because like, it, it's because this is actually a joint. Um, you have a joint here between um, one of the <coughs> sorry one of the bones of the chest wall and the collarbone. Um, so between those two, you can get you can get a gout flare. Yeah, you can actually. Um, I've seen pictures. I've never seen this in person, but uh, I've seen some pictures of gout. Uh, depositing in the bridge of the nose also. Um, and then one of the places you could get it also that we look for on exam when people come in with gout flares is on the earlobe. So you can get deposits of gout on the earlobe as well. Oh, everyone's checking their earlobes now. <laughs> uh, so where does gout come from? Uh, so it comes from crystals of something called uric acid. And what uric acid is, is... Um, it's a substance that's produced by the body as part of the breakdown of protein, uh, specifically of something called purines. And that's important because uh, purine-rich foods, which I'll talk about later, are the foods that are recommended you avoid in gout. Uh, so uh, this is just a picture of what a gout crystal looks like. It looks like a needle. And gout's mostly a problem of primates. Um, actually, uh, there's some evolutionary studies that show that uric acid may have been helpful in maintaining blood pressure uh, when primates started to walk upright on two legs. So it does have some evolutionary benefit. Um, Non-primates actually have a certain molecule in the body that helps to break down uric acid, so they don't get gout flares like primates do. So uh, once these uric acid crystals, which you can see on the right here, um, deposit in the joint, they trigger a reaction of inflammation um, where you have a lot of immune cells go going into that particular joint and causing a lot of swelling, redness, and pain with typical gut flare symptoms. Uh, and then over time, uh, you can develop more permanent deposits of uric acid, which are called tophi. Uh, which I'll show you pictures of a little bit later on in the talk. So who's at risk for getting gout? The biggest risk factor for gout is having a high uric acid level, uh, and this tends to be more common uh, specifically in men and, and women after menopause. There's some genetic predisposition too, so um, there's two different ways in which people can get increased risk of getting gout. Uh, one of them is that they can have genes that increase their production of uric acid, which tend, is a pretty uncommon thing to happen. Uh, but the more common way that people get increased risk for gout is that they have, um, they're not able to excrete uric acid as easily from the kidney as would normally be expected. And certain ethnic groups actually have higher uh, risk of getting gout than others. Uh, there's, uh, for example, uh, Maori, certain Native American uh, groups, and, ta and Taiwanese uh, people also have increased risk. So there's certain medical conditions that also increase your risk of getting gout. 
Uh, they include chronic kidney disease, psoriasis. Uh, psoriasis because you get more cell turnover in the body and that increases the protein metabolism in the body. Uh, also high blood pressure, which may go back to the evolutionary study that I was talking about where uric acid helps to maintain blood pressure. Uh, and heart failure as well can increase your risk of having gout. And other risk factors include dehydration uh, and also use of certain medications. Uh, specifically, water pills are a big culprit. Um, and then also aspirin. There's some studies that show that that might contribute as well. So a lot of times uh, when people are in the hospital, they actually, that's one of the common places to get gout flares because uh, um, with things like infection or problems with the heart, uh, it increases your risk of getting dehydrated, and so it predisposes you to getting out flares. So I'm going to talk about diet and the risk of getting out based on what you're eating. So the biggest offenders that can increase your risk of getting it are uh, beer and hard liquor, uh, not wine. Actually, wine doesn't increase your risk of getting out. Uh, also, organ meats, uh, such as liver and kidney. Regular soda and high fructose corn syrup, sweetened drinks. Uh, not diet soda. Diet soda doesn't usually increase gout flare risk. Uh, shellfish. And then red meat. These are the five different types of food that are generally considered to be the worst. And that's because they have the highest purine content. And there's a couple of other triggers in in terms of uh, fruits and vegetables and fungi. <laughs> um, so uh, things like tomatoes, asparagus, mushrooms, and spinach uh, may potentially increase risk of having gout flares as well, but it's not quite as clear cut as the foods that I listed in the previous slide. Uh, do you have a question? Does it make any difference if you're cooked or not? Uh, no, no, it doesn't, yeah. Yeah, it's either cooked or raw, it still increases your risk. No, no, not red wine. Wine's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't usually increase your risk of getting out flares. Yeah, yeah, wine, wine is fine. <laughs> um, so there's a small number of foods that have actually been shown to help prevent gout flares, and uh, it's a, kind of a limited list, but um, the one that has the most evidence for it is low-fat dairy products. So pretty much any, any kind of low-fat dairy product, yogurt, milk, um, ice cream, cheese, uh, and the reason why that happens is because it helps you to uh, let the uric acid out through the urine. After how much? Um, <laughs> how much ice cream? I, I don't think, I actually don't really know what was studied, but um, I'd say I'd recommend a serving a day um, if for someone who has, who has gout of a dairy product. <laughs> uh, there's some evidence also for cherries, uh, although it's not really quite as clear cut as with dairy products. So um, there's actually some supplements that are sold um, in pharmacies for gout specifically that have cherry ex extract. And I, I know a lot of people also drink cherry juice um, to help prevent gout flares as well. So how is gout diagnosed? Um, so, the most important aspect is to have the right symptoms and the exam that shows a gout flare. Um, also, there's a blood test, the uric acid level in the blood, uh, which usually we look for it to be 6.8 or higher. That's the level at which it's suspected that somebody could have gout, depending on their symptoms. Um, so if, if someone's having a flare, it can actually be lower at the time of the acute flare. So it, it wouldn't be three, for example, but if it's, for example, six, and you're having acute symptoms, then uh, you could still have gout, depending on what the symptoms are and how characteristic they are. Yeah, but between symptoms, it, it should be at least 6.8, yeah. Uh, and then sometimes x-rays or an ultrasound could be helpful. So this is just on the left is a picture of what um, an x-ray would look like with a TOFAS. Uh, so uh, you can see here on 
the right side, there's this kind of fluffy bump that's not present on the other side in the left foot. Uh, but usually if someone has an acute flare um, with early gout, you don't really see that much in an x-ray. So it's, it's not something that's necessary to diagnose the condition. Also, sometimes if someone's having a flare in a larger joint, such as the knee, for example, um, we would get fluid out of the knee with a needle to look at it under a microscope to check for gout crystals. So that's another helpful technique to uh, diagnose the condition. Uh, in terms of recent advances, this is something that's still kind of more of a research grade um, uh, technique, but uh, there's a special kind of CAT scan that's coming into use to help diagnose gout and assess how bad somebody's gout burden is. Uh, it's called the dual energy CT or DECT. Um, and this is just an example of what a picture from a DECT scan would look like. Uh, the green deposits that are seen around the feet here are, are the gout deposits for this person. Oh, uh, purple is, um, uh, it's, it's artifact, so it's just, um, uh, it's just this effect of getting the, the imaging done. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it doesn't have any significance. So does having gout increase your risk of other health problems? This is an area of um, active research right now and is still in debate. Um, there are studies which show that more people with gout have certain conditions such as high blood pressure. That's probably the one that's most commonly linked with gout. Uh, also diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol, and kidney disease. Uh, but the thing is, it's not, as of right now, clear whether people with gout actually are at increased risk of having these health problems or whether these problems themselves increase your risk of getting gout. So it's kind of a two-way street. Um, and research is still trying to find out whether, you know, what exactly the directionality is between these conditions and gout, and also whether treatment for gout can decrease the, decrease the risk of these conditions. Okay, and now I'm going to talk about how gout is treated. So there's separate ways to treat acute flares, um, and also there's separate ways to treat the um, chronic version of gout and to prevent flares in the future. So in terms of acute flares, uh, there's medications that help with the inflammation. And uh, the most common medications that are used include uh, a class of medications called NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And these include medications like uh, Advil and Aleve, for example. Um, usually for gout flares, uh, it takes more than one tablet of the over-the-counter Advil and Aleve to treat it because just one tablet of these medications is usually just a pain management dose, whereas you need more like three tablets of Advil or two of Aleve to get an anti-inflammation dose of these medications. Uh, there's also another stronger um, NSAID medication called indomethacin, which is commonly used for gout flares as well. Also, another class of medications used for flares are steroids, so either oral prednisone or injection directly into the joint. Uh, and the choice of whether uh, NSAIDs or steroids are used and whether oral or injection medications are used depends on what other medical problems a person has uh, and also on how bad the gout flare is and whether it affects only one joint or whether several different joints are affected. Oh yeah, yeah, th there are. Um, so, um, so with taking it in the short term, um, especially if you have a sensitive stomach, it can cause irritation of the stomach. Um, taking it for a longer period of time, I'd say for uh, weeks, can cause ulcers in the stomach too. Um, and then if someone's taking it for month to years, it can actually cause kidney problems in the long run. So it's not really something that we recommend taking for, you know, months to years. Um, actually, 
The third medication that I have here on the list, colchicine, is the one that's really more preferred for acute flares. And this is a medication that um, has been around since, for millennia, since at least the time of ancient Egypt, um, and has been used specifically for gout flares since that time period. So it's a very tried and true medication. Um, the main side effect of it is that it can cause diarrhea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it can cause pretty bad diarrhea. It actually, um, um, yeah, there's, um, actually in studies, uh, as many as 50% of people who take ultracine have been, have experienced diarrhea. So it's, it's a pretty common side effect. And what is that? So it's not a non-steroidal, it's not a steroid? No. Um, it's kind of in a class of its own. It's derived from an herbal plant that's found in the Black Sea area. Um, it's a prescription medication. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's not available over the counter, at least not in the United States. Um, yeah, and the medicine is also not over the counter. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So the things that are, are over the counter that you could use for um, acute flares are Advil, Aleve, and Motrin. I think that's. I think that's it. As long as you don't have kidney disease. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With, with kidney disease, actually, um, you could use either steroids or colchicine. But yeah, I, I would not recommend using the the NSAID class. And then. Um, sometimes, you know, if someone has a lot of different medical problems um, and they are not good candidates for taking any of the, these medications, um, we recommend to use ice on the affected joint. So in terms of prevention of the flares, the medications that are used are a little different from the ones I just talked about. Um, the goal in this situation is to lower the uric acid level as opposed to, to lower the inflammation level. And so the different medications that are used to prevent flares are allopurinol and febuzostat are the two most common ones. Um, febuzostat is the newer medication among between these two. Um, it's more expensive than allopurinol, uh, and it also has an FDA black box warning because there's some studies that show that it may increase risk of heart attack in people who have heart disease. So if someone has uh, coronary artery disease, we generally try to use allopurinol instead. But um, on the other hand, allopurinol actually, um, in certain people who are genetically predisposed, it can actually cause a pretty serious allergic reaction. So it once again, it kind of depends on the person. What Sorry. Would be the um. So it can actually be potentially fatal. It could be anywhere from yeah. It it could get pretty bad. But it's it's very rare. But um, it could be anything from a rash to just um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But both of them are prescription. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a few other medications that are used that are less common, just um, in case anyone's heard of them or takes them. There's lisinorad, um, which is usually not used alone. It's usually used in combination with the first two medications on this list. Uh, there's an older medication called probenicid, and then there's also a blood pressure medication called lasartan, which can be helpful, especially because it can treat both blood pressure and gout at the same time. And then for very, very severe gout, where it doesn't respond to any of the medications, other medications listed here, there's something called pegloticase, which is an IV infusion that you get at the hospital. And uh, it's a synthetic version of the molecule that non-primates have that helps to break down uric acid. So what happens if you don't treat gout? Um, I just put examples of what TOFI look like here. And these are the common places where you could get them. So you could get them on the toes. Um, see, there's the white. They usually look like these um, small bumps with a white clearing in, in the center. Uh, then the fingers are also a common place to get them uh, on uh, the elbows and the earlobes. And um, if they're not treated appropriately, then the risk with having TOFI is that they can 
get infected. And um, I mean, very, very, very rarely it can get pretty serious where you can get you know, a body-wide infection and it can cause a lot of problems. Uh, also, this isn't quite as clear cut, but um, as I mentioned previously, um, there's some evidence that shows that gout uh, has a link to other conditions such as heart disease and diabetes. So there's, this is not entirely clear, but with untreated gout, it can cause problems with other organ systems as well. So in summary, uh, gout's a type of arthritis that's caused by high uric acid. Uh, the typical symptoms of gout are acute pain and swelling in one or a few joints, most commonly in the legs. Uh, the flare risk uh, for gout increases with certain medications, uh, other medical conditions, and with certain foods and beverages. Gout's diagnosed based on your symptoms, physical exam, blood work, and uh, sometimes imaging or analysis of the fluid from the joint. Treatments for acute gout include the NSAIDs class, uh, including Aleve and Advil, uh, steroid injections or prednisone tablets or colchicine, and then treatments for chronic gout are medications that lower the uric acid level, including most commonly allopurinol and thibuzostat, uh, and also medications like probenicid and pagliotogase. Hmm? Back to sure. right Oh, uh, it's, it's water pills, okay. it's diuretics. Yep. Uh, and then there's also, um, there's some studies that show that aspirin can increase your risk of gout flares as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, does anyone else have any questions? Well, you, uh, when you talked about foods that could be helpful in preventing gout, hmm? I, they showed a bowl of uh, beautiful fresh cherries. Cherries, yeah. Does it matter if those cherries are dry because of the concentration? And I'm thinking of Mm -hmm. because yeah. Diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Similarly, you, you made a reference to uh, cherry juice. Yeah. Which is also concentrated delicious. Yeah. Uh, is, is, that, is, 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 is that injurious because of the concentration? Yeah. I actually I was going to mention this, but I wasn't sure if it was relevant to talk. But um, so sugar content itself doesn't really increase your risk of having a gout flare, but I would generally recommend eating the whole cherry instead of drinking cherry juice just because cherry juice has a lot of sugar and it can cause problems with other things other than gout. But in terms of um, helping with gout flares, it doesn't really make a difference whether it's juice or fruit. But I, I would generally recommend just eating the fruit for other health reasons. And you didn't say high sugar content causes this, but... No. No, no, I mean, f dairy products have a, a good amount of sugar, and dairy products have been shown to, to decrease risk of gout. So there isn't really a correlation between um, things that are high in sugar and having gout flares. It depends on the food itself and how much purine it has, as opposed to how much sugar. Yeah. Is there a difference between arthritis and arthritis? Yeah. Arthritis. Um, yeah. Yeah, there is. So they're treated differently, and they affect different parts of the um, of the body. So arthritis affects the joints themselves, uh, and then tendonitis affects tendons, which are um, there are these structures around the joints that help to connect the muscles to the bones. Um, and then bursitis. So bursa is um, pockets of fluid that help to cushion the joint that surround the joint and they can get inflamed and cause bursitis. So how would you determine what you have? Oh, it, it no, it depends on the, lo the location's a little bit different for all of them. So it depends on the specific location where you're having the worst pain. Um, and if you have swelling too, the way that bursitis or tendonitis looks when it's swollen is different from the way arthritis looks. Yeah, so it, it depends. For gout? Um, not really. In fact, I think, so generally for joint health, it's recommended to do low impact aerobic exercise. So things like walking, uh, bike and elliptical and swimming, and not, not running. Um, but I would say as long as someone avoids high impact exercise, that's better for gout because 
if you cause any kind of trauma to the joints, that increases your risk of getting gout flare. Oh, uh, well, water pills, if someone has heart failure, uh, a lot of times they're prescribed water pills to help to get uh, the swelling out that they have, and that's, that's a pretty big uh, risk factor for getting gout flares. Uh, but nothing, um, no medications like cholesterol medications, for, for example, they don't have any risk for getting gout flares. Yeah. So the other heart medications don't usually, other than water pills and aspirin. Um, that's actually a really good question. Uh, I don't think, caffeine has been studied for gout, um, and there was not found to be any relationship between them. Yeah, so, so caffeine's okay in and of itself. Yeah, as long as it's not, um, in regular soda, because that's, that's the thing that increases your risk of having gout. Yeah, I, I guess it's more the dehydration, but caffeine directly in and of itself doesn't doesn't increase the risk of having gap flares. Yeah. Question: Foods like lentils and anchovies. I, I, re I read to you they can, came under the subject of high pure mm -hmm. foods. Are they to be avoided? It depends on the person. Um, in general, they're not among the foods that are recommended to be avoided for gout, but um, you, know, you know, some people can get flares triggered by certain foods where other people don't. So it kind of, I, I usually recommend for people to kind of keep, either you know, keep a list of things that bothers them or keep a symptom diary, um, or at least you know, try to pay more attention to what what specifically causes gout flares for them, but um, anchovies and um, uh, lentils aren't, just for the general population, they don't usually increase risk of gout flares. Uh, it's usually more severe. So, um, for example, a lot of times when someone's in the hospital and getting, you know, very, very high doses of water pills, that's the situation where you would get a gap flare. I, if someone's really sensitive and has a really increased kind of risk for getting gout naturally, then maybe a lesser extent of dehydration would, would trigger a gout flare for them, but it's usually something more profound, yeah. Yeah, yeah, usually people stay on it for many years. Okay, yeah. so there's no like, bad side effects? No, not in the long term, yeah. Yeah, people stay on it for decades, actually, usually. Is your typical dose, I mean, 100 below, mm -hmm. most people are taking two or 300? Yeah, uh, the maximum dose is usually 600 milligrams, oh, really? but very few people are actually on the 600 milligram dose. Yeah, it's, the average is around 300 milligrams. Um, usually what, um, the way that, uh, I would start med allopurinol is to start with 100 and then check the uric acid level after a month. And then if it's more than six, which is the target for most people, then you increase the dose. Yeah. Uh, not with taking it long term. Um, uh, so, actually, I'll change that response. So, um, if someone has uh, pre severe kidney disease, taking it long term can cause problems with the heart and with the muscles and nerves. Um, but in someone who doesn't have kidney problems, it's not really something that causes problems long term, but it's also not really a medication that we keep people on for more than several months at a time.
Yeah, I, I usually monitor it every few months for people to go. What yeah. Is it's a blood test to check. It's a creatinine level. Yeah. Yeah, just a routine blood test. Oh, great. I used to get, yeah, I used to get it all the time. Yeah. Is that normal that it would change? Yeah. Frequency? Actually, it is. Um, I mean, I don't know your particular situation, but I, I've had some patients where they had a lot of problems with flares when they were younger, and then they come in, and it's been 20 years since they've had a flare. And at that point, I actually, sometimes I recommend them to just stop the alpha-urinol because it doesn't seem like they're really having flares anymore. But... Um, you, you can actually, over time, uh, stop getting gut flares. Yeah. I mean, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on your diet. Um, also, sometimes, over years, somebody can accumulate a lot of uric acid, and so it can cause frequent gout triggers, and then once you take the medication for several years, it clears up all the uric acid, and they don't really have a, an issue with it anymore. Oh, uh, so there are studies that show that dairy products decrease your risk of having gout flares. So they're good for gout. So low-fat lack of dairy low fat. contributing to my getting gout. Uh, I, I don't think you have increased risk of getting gout with not eating dairy, but if you eat dairy, it does help to reduce your risk of getting flares. Yeah, so it's helpful for gout. And specifically low-fat, as you mentioned. Yeah. Low, 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 fat. low fat's what's been studied, yeah. How would you know it's it's both. Um so the blood test usually we look for the blood test to be at least six point eight. Um and uh in terms of how it's stored in the tissues, it's a little trickier to assess that. Um the DECT scan that I showed an example of is one way to look at that, but that's not really something that's widely available currently. Um, sometimes if you have really bad deposits of uric acid, they can show up on the x-ray, like in the, in the example here, where um, they, they look kind of like this on the x-ray. So you get these white kind of hazy substance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the goal. Um, it takes a long time to get rid of them. Yeah, actually, the goal with TOFI, um, with these uh, lumps, is to get rid of them with medication. Uh, so some people have them surgically removed, but um, the goal when you're treating somebody with TOFI with a uric acid lowering medication is for these TOFI to dissolve. No, um, they actually are more a long-term problem. Yeah, they happen when you don't treat gout flares over time. So if someone's having repeated flares um, and they're not on something like alipurinol or fibuzostat, you can get these lumps over time. Yeah, and if you don't treat them, they don't go away. They just stay there for years and years. Oh, yeah. Mushrooms, oh, no. spinach, and asparagus, mm -hmm. which kind of stumped me a little bit because everybody's recommending plant food based diet. You know, how, yeah. What, what's, the, what's the latest on that? Yeah, that's what I tried. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's what I eat. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, if you eat it and you don't have, you know, flares, that's fine. You could just keep eating it. I wouldn't tell you to stop eating these foods. It, it's, it is tricky because. The things that are good for you aren't necessarily things that are good for gout. Um, there, you know, as I mentioned before, for example, dairy products have have a relatively high sugar content, but they're good for gout at the same time. It's more about how much purines the, the each individual food type has. Um, but these foods, as opposed to the ones over here on this slide, these are a little bit more questionable in terms of 
what effect they have. Um, so, I mean, if you're eating these and you don't have any problems with them, I would just keep eating them. I don't think there's an issue with that. Um, oh, uh, it depends on how often you're having the, if you're having an attack once every five years, then I probably wouldn't check the uric acid. But if you're having at least one attack a year, I probably would check the uric acid level. Um, yeah, it depends on how frequently you're getting attacks. Yeah. But it is one of the things that can be checked in a regular blood mm -hmm. test. So That's right. Uh, if you have, some people actually check the uric acid level just as part of routine lab work too, but um, it doesn't really tell you much unless you have gout. Um, but you know, if you do have gout, then it's it's worth checking it if you're getting routine labs anyway. That's true. That, that's true. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, you got kidney stones, but I mean, you know, if you're not having flares. Even if you've had flares in the past, if you check the uric acid and it's high, it's not necessarily something that you would need to treat if it's not a problem. Yeah. What about the uric acid that is considered baseline? Um, 6.8 is usually the minimum. Um, so, uh, Usually, actually, so if your uric acid is higher than nine, um, it's usually recommended that you take allopurinol for posistat, um, regardless of how often you're getting flares. Um, Did the comment you get flares and stop taking it, like, you lost focusing with your uric acid? Like, once you get a blood test, your uric acid is high. You think you're doing it better, you lost focusing. Mm -hmm. No, actually, so usually what's done is um, when when we're first starting allopurinol for Boosestat for urate lowering, you start it at the same time as either colchicine or prednisone or an NSAID medication. Because uh, when you're first starting allopurinol for Boosestat, it actually increases your risk of getting gout flares initially. So for the first six months or so, you're supposed to be on both colchicine and allopurinol at the same time, um, and then you stop the colchicine, and it's not supposed to cause problems once you're within. Um, I mean, I'm asking because as I'm getting older, I'm getting more and more concerned about it. Oh, oh, really? With the knee that he can't bend. Oh. Because he's been on colchicine for long, along with allopurinol, got good blood test results. Oh. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. I think September is actually. A l I think now it's a little too early. Yeah. It, it, so, usually it's recommended that you continue the colchicine for at least six months after you're within the norm, the target, your rate, your rate range. Um, but if that happens, I would recommend to go back on the colchicine. Yeah, because it, it could it could have been a trigger for sure for the gut flare. Um, but typically, you're not supposed to continue both of them for you know the rest of eternity. You're supposed to stop the colchicine after a limited period of time. So what's the limit? Um, at least six months after your uh, urates within the target range. Yeah, that's that's the limited period of time. So I mean, it could be, it could be six months. It could be a few years before that happens. Right. Yeah. 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 
something that perhaps builds up over time. Yeah, it could be. Um, I mean, in terms of foods, it's, I think it's usually pretty fast. It's within a couple of days, um, but sometimes it's hard to tell what the trigger is. And some people just have flares without, you know, eating any offending foods at all. It just comes out of nowhere, seemingly. Um, but you can definitely build up uric acid over time and increase your risk of getting a flare. Um, but, you know, with each individual meal, it, it usually something that happens within a few days. Um, it's usually, I'd say, three to, f to f six, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>